Hi, everyone. Welcome to Beacons of Balance. I'm Arlene. I'm Joanne. My wonderful oh. partner, Joanne. And this is our wonderful special guest, Rosemary Thornton, who we'll introduce shortly. If it's welcome, your first Rose. time coming to Beacons, welcome. The channel is all about balance. We live in a world of duality, up, down, black, white, left, right, and that's not going to go away. So we share with you, we bring on wonderful guest speakers, and we share with you different pearls of wisdom to help you to live in balance, to try to be in balance. When we're this way, we're really out of kilter. So that's right. what it's all about. So thank you, and thank you for once coming back on. And this is a very exciting show we're having today. So uh, we have a very exciting guest, as I said, Rosemary Thornton, who will share her and near-death experience, her NDE, with us today. And Joanne will be doing her introduction and her bio. Yeah, I'm not, first of all, thank you so much for joining us, Rosemary. I know you've been on so many different podcasts. I think you mentioned probably close to 70 and with millions and millions of viewers. But I always say, and we had this in a conversation prior, that the reason we do this is not for us, but it's more to help other people that are struggling, you know, with what you've gone through. It gives them hope, you know. So thank you for joining us. Um, I know you've had a profound experience. I was going to read your bio, but then I thought it's going to be your whole story. So um, I'm going to just ask you to just get right into it, if you don't mind. How did this all start? What happened? Can you take us back? <laughs> well, um, I guess I would start with, uh, you know, my as my bio says, I think the bio does give some background. I was a, a writer. I had worked for newspapers, magazines, websites, everything. Ended up writing nine books. Wow. And then uh, I married my second husband in uh, uh, 2007. And we were married for 10 years, and I thought of him as the love of my life. In fact, in our marriage vows, I publicly thanked God for bringing this man into my life. I went through a time of a lot of loneliness between my first and second marriage. My first marriage had ended in divorce. And at times, I felt so profoundly lonely. And I would consistently, sometimes several times a day, I would thank God for bringing the perfect man into my life at the perfect time. And that manifested itself in so many lovely ways. Like one day we had a heavy snowfall and I lived in a little rental house in the Midwest. And I thought, oh, I don't even own a snow, a snow shovel. And my neighbor appeared with his tractor and cleared out my long driveway and, and uh, the sidewalk. And then he just knocked on my door and he said, yeah, I figured you didn't have a snow shovel. So there were so many instances of the perfect man appearing at the perfect time. And then when I met my husband, I felt he really was the answer to these prayers because we were two peas in a pod. We had so many similarities. So uh, we were married pretty quickly. And uh, then after about 10 years of marriage, one day he came home from work and he ended his life at our home. And uh, I have always been a very sensitive soul a typical creative type, overthink everything. Ruminating is my secret power. And I was uh, beyond devastated by this. And I, the amount of guilt that I felt cannot be described beyond guilt. I felt, uh, I honestly thought about taking a vow of silence. Wow. Because in the beginning, after somebody takes their life, you think about every single thing you said, every single conversation that transpired, and you blame yourself. Sure. And you think, if I hadn't said that thing, if I hadn't have done that thing, maybe he'd still be here. And an aside that I mentioned in my book that I think is pretty important, I, I had been a very faithful uh, attendee at a Christian church in our town. And after this, um, I tried to go to church, and I went a handful of times, but somewhere around the four to six week mark, and so I'm still in shock. I'm still really messed up. I lost the ability to eat. I lost 35 pounds in a minute. I just dropped a tremendous amount of weight. But I walk in the church and they do the altar call and say, if anybody needs prayer, come to come to the front. We'll pray for you. So I had done that, you know, before his suicide. I thought, well, if anybody needs prayer, it's me right now. No. So I was in a circle of these three elders of the church. And uh, this woman says to me, she says, uh, is there anything you need to confess before we begin our prayer? And I was like, I don't know. Uh, and I said, 
I think I think I had gone up there and told them I wanted to pray about healing from the deep grief of my husband's death. Sure. And I said, well, uh, uh, I, you know, I could have been a better wife. And she said, is there anything else you need to confess before God? And, and I said, well, uh, you know, I kind of was a shrew at times, I guess. And honestly, I didn't think I was. I mean, I was pretty careful not to raise my voice in the house. I always believed you should never scream unless the house is on fire. And even then you shouldn't scream. So I said, well, I guess maybe I was a bit shrewish at times. And then she said, you need to confess your sins before the Lord if we're going to pray about this. Yeah. And I, to my credit, because I had been a newspaper reporter, I was pretty tuned into picking up on people's vibes. I said, what are we going for here? And she had known my husband because he was uh, he was in a position uh, in the community that he was pretty well known. And when I said that, what are we going for here? She said, a man like your husband would not have killed himself without a good reason. Wow. And but I was like, oh, it, so we're going for adultery. That's what we're going for? That's what we're asking about? See what I've been doing? Make him do this? That, yeah. that deal? And I realized that's what she was doing. And I said, um, we're done here. And I walked out of the church and never went back. It, you know, so th that's on a clerical clergy level. Yeah. And then also something a lot of people don't realize is when your spouse kills himself, you, the survivor, become the prime suspect in a murder investigation. Right. A lot of people don't realize that. And I've gotten a lot of email. I get I get a lot of email and I cherish every one and I read every one. This one woman said, you need to preach that more because she said, not only, you know, you're in shock. Your world has just changed. Your spouse is dead. Right. And then the cops, this one woman said, the cops handcuffed me, took me into custody, made me spend the night in jail until they could sort out what really happened. Which I really so don't... society blames us, even if they don't think we actually did it. Right. They blame us for forcing them to do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a, a brutal position. So I lost the ability not only to eat, but I moved out of the house where this occurred, and I could not go back to the house except for emergency things like, you know, getting my clothes and such. Sure. And I tried I, I tried living with different people, and nobody could manage me. I had terrible nightmares. I'd wake up in the middle of the night screaming. When I could sleep, I couldn't eat, et cetera, et cetera. And this woman took me in. She's in the book. Her name is Tracy. She took me in, and I lived with her for four months. And uh, with her, I learned how to eat again. And then uh, I lived with another friend for about two years after this. So it was, I, I just can't describe how devastating this is to a person. And it's amazing that I survived at all. Because I remember I had a financial advisor sit down with me at about the six month mark. And she said, she's all perky. Perky people make me nervous. Wow. And she said, where do you see yourself in two years? You know, like, what are your financial goals? And I said, two years, pff, that's easy. I'll be dead by then. And she said, that's not very positive. And I thought, I, I just knew it. I knew I wouldn't last long. I mean, this was way too much trauma. Uh, the I think it was the American Psychological Association said the suicide of a close loved one, in other words, a spouse or a child, is um, one of the most severe traumas uh, that a human being can know. And it's on a parallel with uh, being a survivor of a concentration camp. So it's um, pretty much as bad as you can go. Okay. So I knew I was in danger of, and I didn't care. I just thought insanity might be simpler. So then I was praying every day. I had three prayers. And and this is a fact. I you know, even though you don't believe in God, you find yourself still talking to her or him. So I was praying, I said, God, heal me or let me die. Um, two, when I die, spare me the life of you. Because I loved reading about NDEs. Oh, I read about NDEs all the time, just fascinated by the topic. Um, so I knew there'd be a life for you. So heal me or, or spare me the life of you when I die. And three, I couldn't face any more hard decisions. There had been so many difficult decisions that I had to navigate in this new world. It got to a point where I ended up buying a plethora of white polo shirts and like four or five pairs of jeans. So I could open the closet and say, hmm, what will I wear today? Oh, a white polo shirt and a pair of jeans. <laughs> I just couldn't handle decisions. So 29 months passed that way. And then I was diagnosed with stage two cancer. And uh, I went uh, in for a surgery to determine uh, so they could you know, poke around and pick around to see how far this had really spread. No. And uh, after the surgery, I woke up in the hospital room and they said, uh, you know, you can go home now. And I said, no, something, something ain't right. Something's wrong. <laughs> she said, no, it's very common to bleed. It was a cervical biopsy. She said, it's very common to bleed after these. We took flesh from several places. I said, nope, something ain't, this is beyond that. Anyway, but they sent me home. Three times I said, something's gone bad or wrong. And three times I said, oh, you'll be fine. Just get back to home, lie down your bed, you'll be fine. 
because they sent me home. You know, there's a whole subtext of women not being taken seriously when it comes to medical care. And I'm a cheerleader for that too. We are not. Because if I had this whole thing to do over, I would have said, you go get the doctor and you let the doctor put in writing that I'm I'm telling him something's very wrong and he's sending me home. But anyway, no. so they sent me home and I got home and I realized things were still going very badly uh, at home. <laughs> and uh, I actually went into the shower because I had this gorgeous white carpet in my house that I'd recently purchased. Love white carpet. And, uh, you know, when you're bleeding to death, you don't want to mess up the house because, you know, you don't want your heirs to have to deal with housekeeping. So that was very much on my mind. You know, we're all such well-behaved women. So I went and stood in the shower and I figured at least I won't make a mess here. And I stood in the shower and I remember just things were not looking good for me. And I remember thinking, you know, you've been asking God to heal you or let you go. It looks like your prayers have been answered. All you got to do is sit down on the floor of the shower and it won't even be your own fault. You won't have done this to yourself. This is just something that happened after you pursued medical care. No. So I was going to sit down on the floor and I thought about the people, not only in my living room, I had two friends in the living room that had brought me home from the hospital, but I'd also thought about all the people in my life who were so grateful that I had not succumbed to my husband's bad decisions. Right. So I decided I have to try. So I got out of the shower. I wrapped a bunch of towels around myself in a bunch of ways. And then I told them, call an ambulance. I'm bleeding to death. And they did. Ambulance came, took me out, took me away, took me to another ER, one close to my home. And it was a standalone ER, which I don't even know that they should be legal, frankly. Mm -hmm. But that standalone ER, more mistakes were made. They still dismissed my concerns. Wow. And uh, yeah, they didn't take me seriously. But there was this nurse who was only a nurse and a doctor that attended to me. And, and uh, a nurse about my age and the doctor was very young. And uh, the nurse held my hand as the doctor took a look to see what was going on. And the nurse said, um, I looked at the nurse and I said, promise me you're not going to let me die. Because I was pretty frightened. You know, one of the side effects of bleeding to death is a lot of extra anxiety. And I've read that the brain consumes 70% of oxygen required by the body. So when you're bleeding out, you're losing all those red blood cells, your brain's like, I can't even make a decision right now. I mean, it, it really ramps it up. And so I asked the nurse, took her hand. I said, promise me you're not going to let me die. And she said, oh, honey, we have many solutions for this. We're not going to let you die. Mm -hmm. And she said it with such confidence and aplomb. And I was very comforted by that. And she was very maternal. It was almost as if she was saying, I'm right here. I'm not going to let anything bad happen to you. Right. And that was so beautiful. And I felt her love, and I felt her sincerity. So anyway, uh, next thing I know, they gave me some Dilaudid for pain, which is a der derivative of morphine. Yeah. And uh, very close to my last words on earth being, that's some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, next thing I knew, I mean, I just passed out. I don't even remember passing out. But my friend who had gone with me to the hospital was seated beside me. By the way, the nurse and the doctor left the room. And I was there alone in the room, unconscious with my friend. My friend said he was watching. He was kind of watching me and, you know, trying to pass the time, figure out what we're doing next. And he said he looked up at the blood pressure cuff. They had one of those things on you that automatically inflates and deflates. And he said he looked up at it and it said 32 over 25. Gosh. And, and he, he had was no like, professional with you at this point? No. They left me alone in that room. Wow. So he got up to go get a nurse and... As he did, the alarm went off because the next reading was error, which meant it was lower than 32 over 25. Oh. And um, it's pretty interesting what happened next because he said they came into the nurse, is the one who returned to the room, not even the doctor, and they do a sternal rub, which I think is pretty interesting, where they take their knuckles and rake them across your sternum okay. because apparently it elicits an automatic pain response. And so they did that, and he, he still my buddy's still watching this. And he said, I was absolutely, obviously dead. <laughs> and he said, and the next thing was, this is incredible. She checked the plug on the blood pressure machine. Like, oh, it just got unplugged. <laughs> so right. um, it was only after that that they, they summoned the doctor urgently. And he was put out of the room. And he said, within seconds, they called for a crash cart, which, you know, they came running around the corner with that thing, went into my room and shut the door. But I was having a great time. I what? was having a really good time. 
because I remember being awakened out of this deep dreamless state being catapulted out of my body and I mean catapulted right to the point of like a scary roller coaster ride but not scary just go through the fun. that most people go through no tunnel my was experience little... was very yeah. different for most okay it was just that I was in this form and then I was not and I was catapulted and what it felt like and I remember this so distinctly as if there was a silver shiny sinewy band from the crown of my head to the bottom of my feet and somebody had pulled back on it like an archer's bow and released and I mean oh. I went oh and I went flying out of my body and floating and floating and floating away and I was like oh wow well. and my very first thought was my heart has stopped and I thought how do I know that I thought I don't know how I know that but I know that's right but and I'm then I thought to myself having read all these books on NDEs I thought I'm dying and then being the ever-present editor, I said, actually, you're not dying, you're dead. And it cracked me up. And I'm talking out loud to myself as I'm floating away in this perfect blackness, perfect, velvety, ensconcing, peace-filled blackness. And I start to laugh because I think, you're still funny. And I could hear myself, myself laugh. I mean, I giggled. And I thought, this is fascinating because... I don't have breath sounds. Pretty sure I don't have lungs or vocal cords or the traditional accoutrements which produce sound. Pretty sure I don't know about these ears, but the ears I had are back on that gurney. And yet not only am I producing sound, I'm hearing sound. And not only that, I had a background in broadcasting. My first career was broadcasting. And I, I know what I sound like. And I thought, I sound just like me. And now I do I sound just like me. I still have this goofball sense of humor. And yet I still have this natural intellectual curiosity about everything going on around me and I remember thinking I remember hearing myself laugh out loud and that was so comforting because I do have a unique silly giggle and I thought everything I really am has come with me and I thought what did I leave behind on that gurney and I thought guilt self-recrimination regret woe sadness rumination anxiety regret all of it Every negative thing that had defined this experience since my husband's suicide had come with me. I mean, it had, had been left behind. It, it, it had been stripped away from me. And I thought, I've always wondered what I, Rosemary, the neurotic writer, would look like without these negative attributes. And I thought, now I know. This is great. And I, I just cannot describe how immensely comforting it was that all these funny little things about my unique, quirky, eccentric personality had made the transition. And I, I get a lot, a lot, a lot of emails, as in probably, I, I know I get over 20 a day, but the number one thing I hear from people is, I'm, I, I can't stop grieving since I lost my son, my daughter, my husband, my significant other, whatever, but knowing that maybe his funny little giggle went with him is immensely comforting. Knowing the unique qualities that make us what we are go with us. And you know, the word personality comes from the Latin word for mask. So we really are just walk on actors playing a part here. We really are. So as this experience unfolded, I was like, I, I knew it was very clear to me that not only was I having, uh, not only was I crossing over, but what a great experience. And I did not have a life review. And the other very interesting thing to me is fresh out of the body in this experience where I'm floating away, I remember thinking, boy, you know, I had some bills that were due and I had some big bills to pay, medical bills. And I thought, not my problem. <laughs> it was, and also the doctor, I'm sorry, go ahead. Were you uh, greeted by relatives that crossed over prior? No, I didn't see any relatives at all. A lot of people ask me if I saw my husband. I think the person I would be most likely to see is my mom. Uh, yeah. She was probably the closest thing we got to a soulmate. But no, I didn't see them. But what a person, a presence did join me. Okay. And uh, this presence was massive and tall and big. And I remember feeling feeling very happy that I was no longer uh, alone. And I looked up and to my left and I said, with a lilt in my voice, and who are you? And the answer was immediate, again, before I could even finish the sentence. And the answer was, you are the image and likeness. I'm the original. 
And huh. I was like, oh my gosh, my whole life, Genesis 1, 25 and 26. I've struggled and studied to understand what that really means. I never thought of it in the context that there is an original. And this whole thing just went on and on and on. Now, to the world's view, I was gone more than 10 minutes. But in my perspective, if you told me that I was gone for four days, it would have been very believable. Right. Or four hours. or uh, It's it's hard to define. Because just, what is time? I know, Einstein said no time, time of- is an illusion. Right. Yeah. So time is, you know, how many times the earth goes around the sun? How are you going to measure time when you're not anywhere near the earth? Right. So uh, one of the, a lot of things happened, but one of the things that happened was I was told that uh, my mom, my mom had told me a story when I was uh, three weeks old an infant. I, I didn't get out of the hospital for three weeks because at one point I developed sepsis. And uh, one night as a tiny infant laying in the nursery, my kidneys shut down. I mean, I kept going down, down, down. My kidneys shut down. And the doctor shooed my mother out of the hospital and said, we're not going to sit here and let you watch this baby die. She'll be gone in hours. She's not going to make it till morning for sure. Mm-hmm. So my mom went home and prayed. And uh, she prayed with another friend and the no call came over the night for which she was very grateful. And the next morning she said she appeared at the hospital and a nun was holding me in her arms and said, mm-hmm. your prayer saved this baby. And in this heavenly experience was explained to me that I didn't come close to crossing over then, but that I had crossed over. And that's why I was such a oddball, a weirdo, a stranger in this world. I had never felt like I fit in from age six on. I just knew I was either from another planet or something. And that's, I think, part of the reason I had the fascination with the books on NDE. But yes, it was explained to me in this, and I was like, I remember saying this to the spiritual beings who accompanied me. I remember saying, you know, it would have been good to know back then. It's been a hard 59 years, but okay, cool. Let's go. What's next? So it went on and on and on. And uh, I mean, I know our time is limited, but at some point I was, uh, one of the thoughts I had while still floating in this blackness, and the funny thing is I remember thinking this too, there were so many thoughts, but I remember thinking I'm terrified of the dark. And this was well before my husband's suicide. I had always been, always had to sleep with the blinds open a little or a nightlight or something. I was literally terrified of the dark. And I thought, I am in the most perfect pitch blackness I have ever known. And I'm the happiest I've ever been. I have the most perfect peace imaginable. And I remember thinking about the Bible verse, the peace that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And I remember thinking, this is that peace that Paul tried to describe, the peace that passeth anything we can understand and i had that piece and i thought this is so cool i remember the bible verses and i also remember i was set up to start chemo and radiation and i was like that seems to be a problem too i mean i had so many distinct memories of where i had just come from well the next thing i knew there's a there's a gap in memory i went from floating to being in this white room standing on my own two feet and i wish i'd look down because i wasn't sure i had feet but i i saw a door in front of me in this perfect white room And I saw a door in front of me, maybe 15 feet in front of me. And in this room, there was this very gentle white mist falling. And the mist was very thick, almost like a pea soup fog. And yet I remember as I, I remember seeing that door and I was like, okay, I read the books. I know what that door is. That door is the point of no return. That door is, that door is heaven. That door is where I get out of this insane asylum, you know, this, this earth mess. And I remember thinking, ah, everybody out of my way, we're doing the door. And I I thought, I don't know if I have legs or feet or the means by which I can move, but I know if I, I can perambulate with intention. So I had an intention to get to that door as fast as I could. And as I'm moving through this mist, which is not just falling, but actually moving around me, I remember I tried to focus on an individual droplet of the mist, which sounds crazy. Yep. And I have an angelic being or spiritual being with me. And I said, why can't I focus on these droplets? And the angel said, your spiritual eyes have not, or your eyes have not acclimated to the spiritual environment yet, but what you're seeing are particles of light and Uh you're being cleansed. And before you go to heaven, it was likened to a spiritual car wash. We are thoroughly cleansed. Some people die with an idea that their sickness or a mental health diagnosis or a physical problem is an intrinsic part of their identity. And it's not. And we have to be disconnected from that. I mean, I now I know people even now who are just so enmeshed in their disease process. And, you know, whatever you magnify gets bigger. 
Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. But yeah. that's what explained to me that this is washed away from us. And the other thing that was made clear to me, if you do decide to go back, you'll be restored to wholeness. And it wasn't, you'll be healed of this and that and this and that, but you'll be restored to wholeness. You know, the word integrity yeah. has the same etymology as the word wholeness. Which right. It's fascinating. So I see the door and I pretty much say out of the way, there's the door, I'm out of here. And as I get to the door, I, the door was shut, which annoyed me. <laughs> I thought the door should be open, but I put my right hand up to push through the door, pretty fascinated by the fact that right-handed on earth, right-handed in heaven. So, so I put my right hand up, pardon me? You take the left-handed or right-handedness with you. Yeah. I mean, you know, how much of it is spiritual mental habit? But as I do so, I paused. And I asked, because I have an angelic being or companion with me, and I asked, is this the divine will for my life? Because when you're in that place, all you want to do is honor God. Yeah. You know, what is it? Uh, the Westminster Catechism, the point of life is to, uh, oh gosh, glorify God and enjoy him forever. I think that's it. Yeah. And so I asked that, but I couldn't even get, I couldn't even get past, is this the divine? And the answer was, no, it is not. But whatever you decide, you go with all of God's love and mercy and grace and peace and care. There isn't a wrong decision. And I can't tell you how good that felt. No. Because no. it seemed like after my husband's death, there were so many hard decisions and I sometimes made the wrong ones. Yeah. So Rosemary, quick question. Why, in a nutshell, why do you think you came back? Oh, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into that uh, in just a second. But so at the door, um, I was told I was told that I could I could go either way, which, again, was an answer to that third prayer of, you know, decision making. I asked God for no more hard decisions. And uh, I said, if that's the deal, I want to go on. I want to go to heaven. I don't want I don't want to go back. I, I know what's back there. And I was given a vision of that nurse who had been so solicitous and thoughtful toward me. Look. And this was more than a vision. I was in a room with her and she couldn't see me, but I was present in a room with her mm -hmm. and she was, she had her back to me. Gosh, I remember this so clearly. She had her back to me and she was sitting on a supplies in a, on a little stainless steel stool in a hospital supply room, you know, with linens and supplies around her, leaning forward, head in her hands, sobbing uncontrollably. And she said, through tears, I promised that woman I wasn't going to let her die. And I lost her. Yeah. And I thought, she's a nurse about my age. She's lost other patients. She'll get over this. And I thought, I got to get out of here. I can't I can't go back to that mess of a life. And then the next thing that happened was I, I was still in that room, but I wasn't just shown her pain. I felt her pain. It's like I was a co-sharer of her pain. And I recognized it as the same deep grief and agony I had felt after my husband's suicide. And I remember very clearly thinking, um... If I can spare one person on this earth that much pain, I guess I have to go back. Right. And in a split second, I was back in my body. And I mean a millisecond. And I, I remember being a little annoyed because I thought, oh my gosh, all that work, all that effort finally got to the door of heaven. And here I am. So but you were um, healed completely. That is pretty much a miracle in itself. It was. And I mean, it, it went on and on. I was in the hospital for four days and uh, uh, it was it was a very intense four days. A lot of things happened. If you read my book, you'll know that one of the most profound experiences was angels crowded around my bedside and sang to me while I was in the hospital. And right. I told them it was when my human helpers had to you know, take a lunch break or something. Mm -hmm. These angels just appeared at my bedside on the side and at the foot of the bed and sang me beautiful songs glorifying god singing about love and glory and light i mean i don't remember the lyrics but i remember how it made me feel and uh i said to them i'm really good with houses i actually have an exceptional memory for architecture that's my background i said but melody and lyrics not gonna be able to remember this and the angels said this isn't for you to remember this is for your peace this is for your healing and this is a thank you for agreeing to come back and that's when they told me we know that life on this earth is hard and this is not easy to be here so this is our thank you and ultimately it took time it took it took some time and i had to find another oncologist in another part of the state I had to travel some time 
because everyone, once they heard that I'd been diagnosed by this big deal, eminent oncologist, they said, well, you need to go back to him. Right. But yeah, the subsequent surgery, another surgery was done. And this time they had two units of blood on standby. They were like, yeah, we're not doing this again. Uh, but yeah, the I remember the surgeon, an oncologist, actually gynecological oncologist, she woke me up after, you know, I'm in the recovery room and she shook me and shook me and shook me and woke me up. And she said, through tears, she said, you were right. There's not one cell of cancer anywhere in, you know, all these places they biopsied. And my friend who was, again, waiting for me in the waiting room, he said she burst through those doors, came out to the waiting room, threw her arms around his neck and said, not only is there no cancer, but had I not seen the test, I would not believe there ever was because her flesh is so pink and pretty and perfect. Well, that's and more. Th- wow. Pardon me. Is that's pretty amazing. You know, we we have to wrap this up pretty soon. There, I know Arlene. Did you you had a couple questions? <laughs> Just like, there's so much. I know it's like we need three hours for this. That's okay. No, <laughs> there's there's so much. So basically, so the well, it's interesting as I was listening to all this. Really, when you put out those um, three parts that you claim, you actually orchestrated that because when you did cross over, that's actually what happened to you because you did state here that you did not want to have a life review and you didn't have one. Renee, I, I did not have a life review. And I, it's interesting is I asked God to heal me or let me go. <laughs> and I got so there you go. So you got that. So I, now this is my thing. I think what we see, like, I love cherubs. So I think, and I, you know, I think we kind of orchestrate like the movie when we cross over. It's what we kind of ask for. And so that's pretty fascinating. So do you feel the reason you did come back is to help share this, of course, and to help people with their self, if they're suffering to alleviate that? Do you feel that's your main? Maybe. I know that after my husband's death, a woman who had lost somebody very close to her to suicide said she realized that she had every reason to go insane and never recover from this. And she wrote something out and she put it on her wall and it said, God, heal me so I can help others heal. And I did the same thing. Even just a few weeks in the, after my husband's death, I wrote that out and I put it all over my house. Heal me so I can help others heal. So I think if there's one reason I came back, I think that's it. And the other thing I really wish, I really, really wish like heck, there was a way that I could create a foundation to help suicide survivors, specifically women, because I don't, you know, back in the day in the 60s and 70s, if a woman suffered a sexual assault, it was like, well, what were you doing at the bar at two in the morning? Why were you wearing that miniskirt? Did you really need to be in those heels? We're doing the same thing. Right. We're doing something similar to people who survived suicide. Where were you when he died? What was the nature of your last argument with him? Was he sad before this? Did you see the signs? Did you help him? Or did you argue with him? We're doing that now, but on another level. And it's brutal. It's yes. just brutal. And this stuff we talked about on social media, if you're feeling sad, you just reach out to me. I'll, I'll help you through the hard time. That is such an affront to people who, like me, who have survive the suicide of somebody they love. Right. Suicide prevention is just something we do to entertain each other. And I do believe it can help young people. I do believe that. And by young people, I don't know, 23, 25, younger, I don't know. But even then, if somebody wants to do this, you're not going to stop them. And the, the way I made peace with this thing with my husband was I realized when somebody told me this, lots of people told me this, took a while to sink in. There is nothing I could have done to make him do this. And there is nothing I could have done to prevent him from doing this. Right. And you just eventually you gotta find your way to that place. What's that saying? God, why help, you'll go God helps those who help themselves. Right. We have to be the ones to help ourselves to do it. No one's gonna do it for you. Can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And we've got to stop the judgment, people. It is insane. We, you know, it's it is, and and I don't know that. I don't. I, I know that I would not have survived had people not stepped in from the periphery of my life. You know, it's interesting. My husband was a successful professional. I had some success and acclaim as an author. I'd been on lots of fancy national shows doing my architecture thing. Okay. And yet after his death, all those people disappeared. All the fancy people disappeared. And who came into my life was what the world might call working class. All the people on the periphery of my life, they Mm -hmm. literally rushed in 
And a woman said to me, she said the first thought when I, because it was news, it was big news, made statewide news that this had happened to him. And a friend said she was in the radio when she heard this and she pulled over in her car and she sobbed because she said to herself, her first thought was, we're going to lose Rosemary. And she, she's actually the one who took me in and said, I just, I didn't want to lose you. Well, thank God you're here and you survived and we need you. The world needs you. <laughs> Your message is profound. And I, I'll just pray every night that you get this foundation going because it's needed, you know? Very much so. We've yeah. got to wrap this up pretty soon, Arlene. But I know I had one question. Uh, what was the most profound thing that you learned? If, you, if it was one thing you can share to the public that you learned to put their mind at ease? Well, I've, I've often said in this, if I could sum, if I had to sum up the whole experience in three words, it would be when I was in heaven, it would be welcome home, dearie. Wow. I have felt like such an outlier my whole life and such, all, honestly, almost a freak. And yet in that place, I was surrounded by my people. And they were all, I mean, I've, I, I, they weren't beings per se. This was in the blackness, but they kind of surrounded me and said, yeah, that was a hard one. But here you are. Look at you. We're proud. so proud of you. We're so glad to see you. Which is the words I've longed to hear my 59 years of life. Everyone So does. yeah, when you... Yeah, so when you get there, you I think you just, you finally get the unconditional acceptance and love, especially, I mean, I don't have what the world calls a, a family. I have three beautiful daughters, but I don't have the extended family um, that so many of the world have. Um, so yeah, I think it's just, we're here on a mission. I do believe that. And some people collapse under the weight of it, and I don't blame them a bit. And as I said, I, I couldn't help myself, but people came in and saved me, and I don't know why. <laughs> so so with, you saying, I mean, with you saying that, you said, we're here for a mission. Did they share with you on the other side what we're here for? No. What no, I got nothing. You got nothing on that? Okay. <laughs> I got nothing. I know that, I, like we talked about, I think we talked about this before we were recording, yeah. but... Uh, an angel appeared to me uh, less than a year. Actually, is about actually just about six months after my NDE. An angel popped up in a church, right standing, and it was an angry angel, you know, with a the Roman suit of armor and the big sword and the headdress and all the you know big shoulder fancy stuff. I guess I should learn those terms. Uh, this big angel showed up in the church, and I was kind of like, anyone else seeing what I'm seeing? And this angel said to me, um, told me to get get this book done. I was like, wait, what book? <laughs> No. <laughs> but yeah, the angel was very clear that I was to get this book and to get it done and to stop worrying about my pride, which, you know, it's pretty, pretty humbling. Vulnerable is a good word. Put yourself out there and tell this story because I get my share of email and oh my gosh, if you want to read, if you want to write a review of my book at Amazon, have at it. But please stop saying you hate the book because I referred to God as she. Oh my gosh. I don't even think these people read the book. It's but very anyway, yeah narrow-mindedness on their part i saw those reviews i and i thought well, oh my god yeah it, anyway <laughs> don't get me just, started don't get me just started. bless them all it's, it's, you have to just reason, it's a reason for everything yeah we love them you understand it but there there is and my whole thing and my message was the key to unlock all the mysteries is love it's all love. this love people get out of here and for those that are listening on the podcast i'm pointing to my brain my our minds and get dropped down into your heart Come from your heart always. Right. Do everything with from a love base. Because if it's not from a love base, that's when all the difficulties and everything will then. So Rosemary, thank you for taking time. Joanne, do you have anything else that you Yeah, so Rosemary, you know what this show is all about balance. So how do you bring balance? Oh, true. Yeah. Like right now. Thank yeah. you, Joanne. <laughs> Forgot yeah, what's the question? How how do you find balance in your life? Because you're going, you know, full tilt. With all the <laughs> podcasts, radio interviews. Well, I actually, it's kind of funny. I moved to Florida and then I was in Florida. I was like, yep, I don't like it here. So I moved back to the Midwest. <laughs> well, that's... So, you know, it's pretty funny. It took a lot of, it took a little bit of courage to like, you know, because I had loved the Midwest, but to move to the, to Florida. But it takes a lot of courage to say, yeah, this, this ain't right. And I move back, oh, but I bought a house. I bought a very modest but beautiful home, and it's on the edge of a great big cornfield. So oh. I had mentioned a prior podcast, and it's true. I love watching corn grow, 
but they didn't plant corn this year. They planted soybeans, but it's still fun to watch them grow. But I talked to the farmer and I said, next year corn? He said, yeah, next year corn. Right. But my balance is in nature and in color. I love watching things grow. Yes. My house out my bedroom window has these great big trees. And sometimes I just lie in bed and I watch them oh, sway yeah. back and forth. You appreciate and I love watching the thing. plants grow. Yeah, you yeah. appreciate nature on a level that I never thought. After they something. are. They're miracles. The flowers, everything's a miracle when you look at it. Yeah. Well, and I, and I had my heel. I mean, I my friend who took me in for four months, Tracy, she lived on the edge of a 110-acre peanut farm. And I would spend, I would just take my lawn chair out there and watch the peanuts grow, which peanuts are pretty interesting too. But I, uh, I thought about the corollaries to my own life, that there were so many people, some in my very most intimate inner circle who had given up for me, uh, given up on me rather. And it's like, like the seed, to plant the seeds to grow anything, you just trounce it into the ground and you look like you're killing it and you look like there'll never be anything good that happens from that again. And that's what had happened to me. I had been you know, married to this man I loved. We had a good life. He had a sufficient income. And I just got trounced into the dirt by life, by hardship, by trauma, blah, blah, blah. And lots and lots of people decided and they walked out of my life. They decided I would I would just end up dead soon. So the people who came into my life to save me, the people who were at the periphery of my life that came in to save me, they're the visionaries. They're yeah. the ones who said, we're not giving up on her. This yeah. may be really bad and she may never be flying high again and she may never be the person we knew, but she is still a human being worth our love, our attention and our care. And they, I, I just can't say enough about them. I get so many beautiful emails and I'm grateful for truly each and every one. But the real heroes of the story are the ones who took me in, who put yeah. their arms around me physically, who fed me. I had so much trouble with food, but they would feed me and they would take care of me. And they said, we don't care what you become as long as you stay with us, as long as you stay close to us, stay our friend. You don't ever have to be this, you know, this big author person again. And I just... I owe them such a debt for for seeing beyond the human picture and saying, "No, yeah. there's there's still something. There's still a spark of light light in you." Thank there, God, those those yeah, those are your earth angels. I was just going to say the same thing. Those are your earth. Those angels. are your earth angels, and that they came from their heart. They came from love. They didn't come with conditions of this, that, or whatever. It's just pure love. And what you mentioned earlier, when you were the infant that was crossing over. Your mother's prayer, those prayers, and people listen to this. So the first of each month, I do a prayer meditation. They, w the world needs it now. And right. as you said, and other people from NDEs that I've had, when people pray, they see, they saw like shards of light going up to the heavens that were being sent out, like boom, 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 like fireworks, but prayers going out. It's so important for us. We need it. Prayers, very this powerful. world needs it. So thank you, everyone, for yes. taking your time for... Um, seeing us listening to us and as always be the beautiful beacons of light that you are send it out to the world we all need that back and forth and rosemary thank you so much thank for, you so much rosemary thank, thank you, you joanne and thank you Arlene. to subscribe to like make comments nice comments help no, make comments <laughs> <laughs> we'll have all of rosemary's information right just so you know rosemary will be listed below oh. um <laughs> and if they want to contact you and just all nice comments <laughs> please yeah and i do have a website and that's how people can contact me my website is temporarydeath.com mm -hmm. i don't like the expression near death because this is not what's happening with folks like me mm -hmm. we die and then we get resuscitated or we come back but near death is such an odd such odd nomenclature it really is mm -hmm. well i think every when we go through loss whatever the loss may be, I have always said to people, a loss is death. A loss is death. And we have to go through that grief and that process. So, Joanne? Thank you again. It's just, I, I love everything I heard. And you're going to touch a lot. You're touching millions already. You know that, Rose. So thank you for that. And thank you for you're coming welcome. on our on our, um, our site here. <laughs> We're starting out, so we don't have... We don't have the millions yet, but you know what? Yeah. As God, you know, they say, if you touch one soul, right? If you touch one in the realm, it's wonderful. Exactly. No. All righty. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Love and peace. Bye. Bye.